The Nephilim Origins of the Nephilim Angels' origins are distinct from those of humans. They were made on different times and for different reasons. However, scripture indicates a portion of Satan's fallen angels failed to keep their proper domain by materializing and interacting with humans in ways angels were never meant to do. This interaction is depicted in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. Then the people began to multiply on earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with the humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became their heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. This refers to the unnatural progeny of the partnership between the sons of God and the daughters of men. However, there were individuals of distinctive size on the earth both before and after the flood and also afterward. These ones before the flood were notable because of their diabolical element of their parentage. They were the mighty men of old, men of renown. At first glance, there is no indication of angelic or demonic involvement. A passage in Job, on the other hand, provides a better understanding. God explains to Job his omnipotence by recounting his power over creation. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Job 38 verses 4 to 7 The morning stars are best interpreted as angels. We also know that mankind had not yet been created when God laid the foundation of the earth. So the reference to the sons of God is another reference to angels, implying that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are also angels. The Nephilim, or fallen ones in Genesis 6 verse 4, are mysterious personalities. The mighty men who were of old, the man of renown, the text does not explain how the Nephilim arrived. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and bore children to them, it simply states. But why are the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis 6 alongside the intermarriage of the sons of God and the daughters of man? It is unclear how these mighty men of renown came about if they were not the outcome of intermarriage between spirit beings and humans. Jude likely understands Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 to refer to the intermarriage between spirit beings and humans. Jude 6 tells of angels who did not stay within their position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. Unless Jude is referring to an unknown event, he appears to be referring to the angels who left heaven to live on earth in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. These arguments support the traditional view that the sons of God mated with human women and gave birth to the Nephilim. Though this may appear strange to modern ears, the same could be said for the entire Bible. Truth is stranger than fiction and the world God has created is far from what we commonly believe. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. We can deduce why Satan sent his angels to intermarry with human women, directly or indirectly. 
Satan attempted to pollute mankind's genetic pool with satanic corruption, planting something resembling a genetic pathogen in order to render humans unfit to bear the seed of the woman, the Messiah promised in Genesis 3 verse 15. The Savior could not be born of a demon-possessed mother, so if Satan could succeed in infecting the entire race, the Deliverer could not come. And Satan came close to succeeding. The people had become so polluted that God decided to relaunch with Noah and his sons and imprison the demons who had polluted it so that they could never do it again. God's reaction to this great wickedness my spirit shall not strive with man forever. God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This means that our rejection of God has reached a point of no return. God will not woo us indefinitely. There will come a time when he says, no more. Even more reason for us to declare that today, rather than tomorrow, is the day we will respond to Jesus. We have no promise God will draw us some other day, yet his days will be 120 years. This is interesting as the flood also happened 120 years after this announcement. This violation of God's prescribed boundaries so frustrated him that he immediately sent a flood to destroy the entire earth and all traces of these unholy unions. The Nephilim were one of the primary reasons for the Great Flood in Noah's time. Immediately after the mention of Nephilim, God's word says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Genesis 6 verses 4 to 8 In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he had ever made them, and put them on the earth. It broke his heart, and the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. God then flooded the entire earth, destroying everything except Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark. Everything else perished, including the Nephilim. Genesis 6 verse 6 states, The Lord was sorry. Other translations use the word repent here. The Hebrew word for feeling sorry or repentance is nakam, and it means be in mourning, to sigh deeply. To say that the Lord repented is God using human language to help us understand his heart. The verse implies that human sin broke God's heart. God is complete love. He loves us and does not want anything to go wrong with us. It breaks his heart when we sin, and he is broken over our sins when we sin. But why were men suddenly so violent? Was it because the godly line mixed with the ungodly line? Or was it, at least in part, because humanity had mixed with spirit beings? I would like to argue for the latter. Genesis 6 verses 12 to 13 God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Were there Nephilim after the flood? It appears that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood. However, it is likely that it occurred to a much lesser extent than before the flood. 
The Israelites returned to Moses with the following information after scouting the land of Canaan. Where does the Bible mention Rephaim? The Rephaim are first mentioned in Genesis 14. The Bible relates the political situation that led to Abraham's nephew, Lot, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah being taken captive. Before that, King Kerdelaoma conquered the Rephaites at Ashtaroth Karnaim. The same king also defeated the Zuzim and Emim. If we assume that the Rephaim along with the Zuzim and Emim were giants, then the Bible is implying that King Kerdelaoma was a powerful king. He defeated great armies. As King Kerdelaoma rose to power and consolidated nations and lands, other kings formed a confederation to oppose him. Sodom and Gomorrah were part of the confederation. After the confederation loses a battle against King Kerdelaoma and his allies, their territory is raided and Lot is among the captives. Abraham learns about these occurrences from a survivor. Abraham gathers his people's arms and leads them into battle where they join forces with other monarchs to defeat King Kerdelaoma. They are successful in the end. Genesis 14 verse 12 They also captured Lot, Abram's nephew, who lived in Sodom, and carried off everything he owned. The Rephaim, along with other large people, are mentioned in Deuteronomy 2 verses 20 to 21. Deuteronomy 2 verses 20 to 21. That area was once considered the land of the Rephaites, who had lived there. Though the Ammonites and the Zamzunites, they were also as strong and numerous and as tall as the Anakites. But the Lord destroyed them so the Ammonites could occupy their land. Deuteronomy is a book that contains Moses' final words before Joshua sends the Israelites into the Promised Land and Moses recounts much of Israelite history. In Deuteronomy 3, there is an interesting story about King Og of Bashan, a giant man who was the last of the Rephaim. The name Rephaim, which literally means terrible ones, gives us an indication of the intimidating and fearsome nature of these individuals. As we delve into the passages of the Old Testament that speak of the Rephaim, we find that the context of these passages describes them as giants. And while the term Rephaim is often used to describe these towering figures, it is important to note that the Hebrew word Rephaim has two distinct meanings. Firstly, in poetic literature, the word Rephaim is used to refer to departed spirits whose dwelling place is Sheol. This meaning is figurative and serves as a description of the dead, like our concept of a ghost. Secondly, the word Rephaim is used to describe a mighty people with tall stature who lived in Canaan. This meaning does not refer to a specific group, but rather serves as a descriptive term for a group of people with a specific characteristic, in this case, tall stature. Og is referred to as the last of the Rephaim in Deuteronomy 3 verse 11 and later in the books of Numbers and Joshua. Rephaim is a Hebrew word for giants. In the days of Moses, Og, king of Bashan, was a mighty and infamous Amorite king of Bashan who reigned at Ashtaroth, who fought the Israelites on their way to the Promised Land. As the Israelites journeyed towards the Promised Land, they encountered many formidable foes, and King Og was one of them. He fought fiercely against the Israelites and led his entire army against them. Before the Israelites fought King Og, they also had to deal with King Sion of the Amorites. But the Lord had already given them and his territory to Israel so the Israelites had the victory before even starting the battle. Now, the king of Israel had to deal with King Og of Bashan, who also sent his entire army against Israel. Og was another Amorite king who posed no threat to Israel because the Lord had already given him and his territory to Israel. 
Before he even put on his armor, Og's defeat was a foregone conclusion. The Israelites then marched towards Bashan, where King Og confronted them at Adrei. Because of Og's reputation, the Israelites were terrified. Do not be afraid of him, for I have delivered him into your hands, along with his entire army and his land, God assured Moses. The book of Deuteronomy includes a narrative of a conflict that occurred between the forces led by Moses and those led by Og. According to the biblical account, Og was the ruler of 60 different walled cities, all of which were taken by the Israelites. Og, like Sion, marched out against Israel with his entire army to fight, and as in the case of Sion, God had already decided to hand over the king along with his entire army and land to Israel. Israel slayed the entire forces and conquered all 60 cities in the kingdom of Og, which had the same tall walls as Sion's. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. Later, at the city of Jericho, the most spectacular demonstration of that truth would occur. In addition to this, he was a very large man and slept in a bed made of iron that was 9 cubits long by 4 cubits wide, 13.5 feet long and 6 feet wide. The inclusion of this detail draws attention to Og's massive stature. A man in need of this size bed was most likely tall. The Israelites did not need to be concerned about the size of their adversaries. All they had to do was remember how big their God was. Through their faith in the Lord and obedience to his commands, they were able to conquer the territory of these powerful kings. It Rahab, a Jericho prostitute, believed the Lord had power even over that heavily fortified city because she and others had heard of the victory over Sion and Og. Moses used the victory to encourage the Israelites as he left them in charge of Joshua and about to enter Canaan. Deuteronomy 31 verse 4 The Lord will destroy the nations living in the land, just as he destroyed Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites. Despite King Og's enormous size and strength, God granted Israel's army victory, and they took possession of the land of Bashan. The news of the victory against Og swiftly traveled across Canaan, striking fear into the hearts of the people who lived there. Rahab, a Jericho prostitute, believed the Lord had power even over that heavily fortified city because she and others had heard of the victory over Sion and Og. Joshua 9 verse 9 to 10 They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country. We have heard of the might of the Lord your God and all he did in Egypt. We have also heard what he did to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River. King Sion of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. In order to illustrate God's unwavering commitment to his people throughout the ages, the Israelites frequently praised him by rehashing the story of how they had triumphed over Sion and Og. Psalm 135 verse 7 to 11 He causes the clouds to rise over the whole earth. He sends the lightning with the rain and releases the wind from his storehouses. He destroyed the firstborn in each Egyptian home, both people and animals. He performed miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt against Pharaoh and all his people. He struck down great nations and slaughtered mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. Perhaps you do not know what lies across the valley, but look at the worry in comparison to the Lord God himself and say by faith, The battle is yours, Lord. It is your battle. I lean on you. It is God's love for us that causes him to bring us to an end of our own strength. He sees our need to trust him, and his love is so great that he will not tell us to live another day without turning over our arms to him.
our fears, our worries, even our confusion, so that nothing becomes more significant to us than our Father. Never ever forget, the battle is the Lord's. There is nothing too difficult for God, nothing is too difficult for Him. Matthew 19 verse 26 Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God everything is possible. God does not tremble in the presence of giants, and his children should not either. Og, king of Bashan, was one of the last of this race of giants. Og and his sons all died as a result of their foolish opposition to God's people. Despite King Og's enormous size and strength, God granted Israel's army victory, and they took possession of the land of Bashan. Manasseh's half-tribe inherited Og's territory. David battles with the Philistines several times throughout his life, and one famous place was called the Valley of Rephaim, a place southwest of Jerusalem in the land of Judah. 2 Samuel 5 verses 17 to 18 When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king of Israel, they mobilized all their forces to capture him. But David was told they were coming, so he went into the stronghold. The Philistines arrived and spread out across the valley of Rephaim. What happened to the Rephaim? In Joshua, the giants make multiple reappearances throughout the book. Even Caleb, the sole surviving survivor of the 40 years spent in the desert, has stated that he intends to fight for the territory that giants rule. Caleb was well past his 80th year when he prepared to do battle with some giants. Joshua 14 verse 12 So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts we found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land, just as the Lord said. Joshua and the Israelites didn't slay or remove all the people from Canaan, which creates a cycle of idolatry and deliverance in Judges. It isn't until 1 Samuel that we see the giants again. Goliath and his brothers The most well-known giant in history is Goliath from the Bible. He was a champion from the Philistine camp who fought as an armored charioteer. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. 1 Samuel 17 verse 4 we don't know what that information means at face value because we don't measure things in cubits or spans. We measure them in feet and inches, so let us put it in layman's terms. Goliath was a massive man, standing at least 9 feet and 9 inches tall. And when you consider the length of his arms when he lifted them up over his head, you can imagine what an imposing creature he must have been. It wasn't just his size though. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. Tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds, his armor bearer walks ahead of him carrying a shield. 1 Samuel 17 verses 5 to 7 He was dressed in what we'd call mail coat. The Philistines warmed up by donning a large canvas-like undergarment with overlapping bronze ringlets. From shoulder to knee, his coat of mail shielded the wearer from the enemy's weapons. Body armor of this size and type weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which equates to between 175 and 200 pounds in modern terms. The armor only included the coat of mail. Goliath, on the other hand, wore a bronze helmet, bronze leggings, greaves to protect his shins, and carried a bronze javelin or spear slung between his shoulders. 
the head of his spear alone weighed 600 shekels of iron, or about 20 to 25 pounds. According to the written account, he marched ahead of him with a shield carrier. The Hebrew word used here refers to the largest battle shield, which is the size of an adult man. It was unmistakably intended to protect his body from incoming arrows. So, in addition to his body armor, Goliath had this guy racing ahead of him, wielding a man-sized shield for extra protection. Allow your mind to picture such an imposing sight for a moment. Consider how terrifying it would be to take on a giant of this size who is protected by this much armor. Without a doubt, the odds are stacked against anyone foolish enough to confront him in battle. Take note of what this gigantic warrior did. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. Samuel 17 verses 8 to 9. Goliath proposed a popular strategy in Eastern civilization, namely representative combat or one-on-one -on -one conflict. He'd represent the Philistine army, while Israel's choice would represent the Israelite army. Regardless of who won, his army was victorious. And whoever lost, his entire army perished. There's no reason to involve your entire army in this. Just send a fighter and I'll fight him. I am the victor. I am the best. Goliath did not issue this challenge once and then disappear. No, his challenge lasted 40 days. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted out in front of the Israelite army. 1 Samuel 17 verse 16 He marched out there every morning and evening for well over a month, flaunting his size and strength daring someone to challenge him. Meanwhile, in the Judean mountains near Bethlehem, a young boy named David was tending to his father's sheep. He was much too young to join the army. David was most likely unaware of the conflict between the Israelites and the Philistines at the time. He might not have even heard of Goliath. His only knowledge was that three of his older brothers were serving in Saul's army. On the other hand, David's father was concerned about his three eldest sons. Jesse was getting older and would probably be unable to complete the journey across the mountains on his own. So he called his youngest son's number and told him, David, I need you to run an errand for me. One day, Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give them ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along, and bring back a report on how they are doing. 1 Samuel 17 verses 17 to 18 So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts. As Jesse had directed him, he arrived to the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield to shouts and battle cries. 1 Samuel 17 verse 20 Then as he approached the outskirts of the Israelite camp, he notices the troops preparing for battle and hears the war cry. He simply wants to observe and see what happens. Then David dashes to the front lines to greet his brothers, leaving his luggage in the care of the baggage handler. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then, David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. 1 Samuel 17 verses 22 to 23 Consider the following scenario. While standing there with his three brothers, David hears a loud cry from across the valley, and instantly, Everyone in his immediate vicinity is sprinting to the back and crawling inside their tents. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, 
they began to run away in fright. 1 Samuel 17 verse 24 Keep in mind that David has never seen or heard of this Gath giant's challenge. As he looks across the battlefield, he sees a giant of a man covered in armor, shouting threats and defiance and cursing the God of Israel. And David was enraged by this. Remember, this is the 41st day that the Israelites have faced Goliath. But this is the first time it has happened to David. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, Yes, that is the reward for killing him. 1 Samuel 17 verses 26 to 27 David then meets with King Saul. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again, he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. 1 Samuel 17 verses 32 to 40 So here's David dressed in the most basic shepherd robes and armed with the most basic shepherd weapons, his sling and staff, and ready to fight. Then, there's the watershed moment. Goliath walks out towards David with his shield-bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. 1 Samuel 17 verses 41 to 46 Consider the possibilities. David remained unafraid in the face of this monstrous beast. David's only weapons were a sling and a stone against a giant clad in 200 pounds of armor. One shot through the air with a whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And that was the end of it. Goliath was reduced to the size of a bag of rocks. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, 
David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. 1 Samuel 17 verses 47 to 51 The Philistines did not return after that. When they realized their champion was no longer alive, they split the scene. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all along the road, from Sharem as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the Israelite army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camps. 1 Samuel 17 verses 52-53 then David brought the head of the Philistine to Jerusalem. David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. 1 Samuel 17 verse 54 The biblical story of David and Goliath is one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. It is a lesson in bravery, faith, and overcoming the seemingly impossible. Was Goliath a Nephilim? Some scholars believe that Goliath, the Gittite, the Gath resident, belonged to a race known as the Nephilim. Other experts argue that Goliath was a Riphaite because the Nephilim were destroyed in the Great Flood during Noah's time. Only Noah's family survived. Nearly 20 times in the Bible, the Riphaites are mentioned. Some scholars believe the Philistines descended from Anakim, Goliath's champion status is enhanced by the fact that Gath was an ancient Anakim stronghold. Some scientists believe Goliath has an inidentifiable family tree, implying autosomal dominant inheritance, which causes familial acromelagy, or gigantism. In biblical times, Goliath was a colossal figure. The Relations of Goliath there are also other giants mentioned in 2 Samuel 21 verses 15 to 22 and 1 Chronicles 20 verses 4 to 8, who were related to Goliath in the Bible. This event occurred when David was old. Even a great man of God grows old. As the years went on, David became unable to fight as he once did. In this battle against the Philistines, David's life was endangered when he grew faint in battle against the descendant of Goliath. 2 Samuel 21 verses 15 to 22 Once again the Philistines were at war with Israel, and when David and his men were in the thick of battle, David became weak and exhausted. Ishbi Benob was a descendant of the giants. His bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds, and he was armed with a new sword. He had cornered David and was about to kill him, but Abishai, son of Zeruah, came to David's rescue and killed the Philistine. Then David's men declared, You are not going out to battle with us again. Why risk snuffing out the light of Israel? After this, there was another battle against the Philistine at Gob. As they fought, Sibakai from Husha killed Saf another descendant of the giants. During another battle at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jair from Bethlehem, killed the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all, who was also a descendant of the giants. But when he defied and taunted Israel, he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother, Shimea. These four Philistines were descendants of the giants of Gath, but David and his warriors killed them. The Israelites faced the challenge of what they would do when they saw weakness in their leader. Since it was a weakness that could be understood, David's increasing frailty and old age, they needed to rally around their leader and supply what he could not. In his advanced age, it was a time for David to retire from the field of battle. His season as a warrior had passed. 
This description of victory over Philistine giants showed that Israel could slay giants without David. Sibakai, Elhanan, Jonathan. These men accomplished heroic deeds when David was finished with fighting giants. God will continue to raise up leaders when the leaders of the previous generation pass from the scene. The defeat of these four giants is rightly credited to the hand of David and the hand of his servants. David had a role in this through his example, his guidance, and his influence. 1 Chronicles 20 verses 4 to 8 After this, war broke out with the Philistines at Giza. As they thought, Sebekai from Hushar killed Saf, a descendant of the giants, and so the Philistines were subdued. During another battle with the Philistines, Elhanan, son of Jer, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath of Gath. The handle of Lami's spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. In another battle with the Philistines at Gath, they encountered a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all, who was also a descendant of the giants. But when he defied and taunted Israel, he was killed by Jonathan, the son of David's brother Shemaiah. These Philistines were descendants of the giants of Gath, but David and his warriors killed them. We read, with twenty-four fingers and toes, six on each hand and six on each foot, this described an unnamed man of great stature from Gath. Since Goliath was from Gath, these were Goliath's sons or brothers. The Philistine warriors are also called Rephaites, or descendants of Rapha, who were on the pre-Israelite groups in Canaan and famous for their size. The story of Goliath in the Bible attests to God's mighty power and great strength over his enemies. Even in the face of overwhelming odds, the story of Goliath in the Bible teaches us that even if we are currently battling big enemies and giant problems that are threatening our peace and livelihood, our almighty Creator will protect and deliver us from all the challenges of this life. We should keep in mind that the giants of the Bible were not forty-foot colossi who sat on houses and picked teeth with elm trees. Societies like ours. Can the punishment seen in Genesis happen once more? The Bible presents a complex concept of what the world will look like as the present age draws to its end through many different prophetic passages. Luke 17 verse 26 Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. It brings together several significant events and trends that, in combination, will make the days immediately before the end of the present age a special and unusual period of human history. Two of these prophetic passages described actual historical societies, and Jesus tells us that we should be aware of them. He says that in the day of his coming the world will be just as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. What were the distinctive characteristics of these societies and how does the world compare? The Days of Lot Jesus compares the end times not only with the days of Noah, but also with the days of Lot. Luke 17 verses 26 to 30 When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings, right up to the time Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. People went about their daily business eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building, until the morning Lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it will be business as usual, right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them.
For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.